So I wanted to give a quick introduction to um, perspective without, this isn't going to be too technical. Um, this is something that I've spoken about so far already. The idea that um, whenever you're drawing, I guess I should say whenever you're drawing representationally, you're doing, um, you're imagining that the, the picture that you're drawing on or the paper or the canvas that you're painting on is this, it's the picture plane. And it's this is the imaginary viewer. You always have to keep in mind the, the viewer. Usually when you're making the work, it's you, but after you're done making the work, it's gonna be somebody else. Um, and in traditional perspective, it's a fixed uh, viewpoint. And you, as you look, you're, you're just receiving a, um, a sort of just slice of what you're going to be seeing on the other side of the window. So I've said this before, I, th I must have, is that the horizon line is the same as the, um, the eye line of the viewer. And the reason why you need to know this is that if the horizon line does bizarre things, like if it tilts, or if it's low or it's high, you're basically telling the viewer who's looking at this that this has something to do with your eye line. You know, if it's tilted, that means the head of the, the viewer is, is supposed to be tilted. It's sort of like, um, it's all in relationship to this, the eye line of the viewer. And it's good to always keep that in mind. So whenever you're drawing and you want to sort of play around with that, you know that you're playing around with the eye line of the viewer. Um, I have to talk about the cone of vision because um, just so you know how to avoid getting distortion, um, it's it's a conceptual idea that if you're going to draw in a correct perspective, um, you you can't have the head of the viewer moving around, and you can only draw within a narrow cone of they say it's what's 30 degrees to the left, and another 30 degrees to the right, and you're you're kind of ignoring peripheral v vision. And you're also sort of ignoring the fact that you know the viewer actually looks around with their head and they move, they have two eyeballs. It's a very restricted, you know, traditional perspective is a very restrictive um, way of looking at the world. And the reason why you need to know this is that when when it comes to to drawing in a correct perspective, which we're going to learn the correct way before we we, we learn the incorrect way. Um, you can't be drawing things too far off in the peripheral vision, otherwise things will get kind of funny looking. So this is giving you an idea what happens. So this circle is, represents the cone of vision. So the viewer is somewhere here. And you can see if you start depicting things outside the cone of vision, things start to bend and warp in a very unnaturalistic way. So traditional perspective keeps things within the cone of vision. So if this was a frame, you know, you'd have to frame it right around here or something. So I'm sure you've all seen this, and I'm sure you've probably all have done something like this one point perspective in basic drawing class in high school if you've taken it. Um, so one point perspective means that the object you're drawing, let's just keep it as a box for now, its fr front plane is parallel with the picture plane. So it doesn't tilt away from the picture plane. It's completely parallel. It's like this um, plane is parallel to the picture plane, which is this imaginary piece of glass. This plane is perfectly parallel. And you move into two point when that tilts. So here's some quick little thumbnails, sketches of one point perspective inside of a room. So keep in mind the horizon line. Even if this was a room, you probably wouldn't even see the horizon line, but it, it would still conceptually be part of the drawing. So you got a high horizon line, you got a low horizon line. You should be asking yourself, what does that imply? Um, 
if you look at this one, a low horizon line implies, and look at the room, it implies we're closer to the ground. So maybe this is a child's view, or maybe this is somebody who's sitting down really low to the ground. And then you have a high horizon line, which is a high eye line. So it looks like, if you look at the room, it looks like we're on a ladder maybe. Our head feels like it's closer to the, the ceiling. Um, this is moving on into two point, but let's not talk about that quite yet. Um, so this is, we're not going to really do any three point perspective, but I, you should know about that. So um, VP means vanishing point. So you, when you have a two point perspective, you have to have a vanishing point here, a vanishing point over here. Um, and then a third one, which tilts the, these um, side um, angles. But look, look, if you see this box here, this is what a box looks like when there's no sort of um, tilting away to to horizon lines, which looks a little, you know, unnaturalistic. Wait, let me go back. So uh, did I even talk about, so the vanishing point, so all the angles will sort of tilt back there. So a two-point perspective will have to have two different um, vanishing points. But let's not get too confusing here. So let me skip this because this is, has more to do with three-point. Again, I guess I should talk about this a little bit because just if you ignore the third point that's off to the bottom, he, he, this is what a box looks like when there's the, the lines don't converge. They're just perfectly parallel. Here they are converging off to the horizon line, which wasn't drawn here. And they're also converging off to a third. Um, um, that's not a horizon line, it's just a third vanishing point. Two point versus three point. We're only going to draw up to two point. Um, so when you're in two point, the corner of the box is what's closest to you as opposed to the face because the face is now tilted away it's no longer parallel with the picture plane now we just have the corner of the box closest to us which now you have to then th push this back to a point and then push this back to another point we're not going to do three point um, we talked about ellipses and how this relates to um, perspective so you can see a circle fitting into a box and once the box tilts it's gonna look like the the circle gets squished and then you can think about it having a major axis and a minor axis which we don't we're not gonna be drawing this but it's good for you to know you can kinda of see the more you tilt the box the more these the circle appears to be squished so you can imagine if it was a cylinder this circle is um, more squished than this one. Um, the reason I think this is something I always keep in mind visually in my head of I sort of imagine here's a cylinder, here's a box in one point, and here's a box in two point. And conceptually speaking, I know it's, it's, they're really just slices of the those shapes, but the horizon line's right here. So the minute... Um, the shape, assuming also, you have to assume that the, the object is perfectly flat, parallel to the ground plane that the viewer's on, because it could easily, these objects can easily tilt, and then things change, but if they're not tilted, um, once you get to the horizon line, it all flattens out perfectly flat, and then when you get below the horizon line, you start to see the top plane, it's as if you're looking down, and the more further down it gets, the further away from your eye line, so the more further, um, down it looks you can see more of the top of it and then the opposite happens here you're looking up underneath the object why because this is where your eye line is so you're looking up at, at it underneath it and you're looking down at the top of it and here's some basic sort of line drawings of still lives um, and I always, whenever I'm looking at a still life, I'm always trying to figure out where was the viewer who drew this. And I kind of try to do almost like a, like a forensic analysis. You can kind of see the lips here is bigger, and then the lips here gets narrower, which means it's approaching our eye line as we go up. 
and the ellipse on this cylinder gets even narrower, which means we're looking, we're still looking down at it. So it means the eye line has to be up here somewhere. And then again, things get trickier once you have things tilted, because this cup is tilted. So it's it, the rules are going to be different. You, you know, it could easily be tilted all the way where you see a perfect circle. So it only applies, you know, these perspe hard perspective rules when it's um, flat parallel to the ground. So if you look at this ellipse, how narrow it is, this implies that it's, it's approaching our eye line, which our eye line is probably right at the edge or to, uh, maybe a little bit further up. And then if you look down, you can see the top of these ellipses. You can see the tops of this box, which means we're looking down. And again, this one's the wild card because it's tilted. Objects on the same ground plane. So um, these are equal with one another, meaning they're exactly sitting on the exact same ground plane. Um, this one we're looking a little further down on. Um, here, here you can see an example of them not being on the same ground plane. What does that mean exactly? Um, it means you have two different um, eye lines where here um, the top is narrow, which means it's closer to our eye line. But if you look over here, we see a lot of the top, which means it's further away from our eye line. So if you were to put this in a picture, they wouldn't match. The only way it would match is if you were to make it look like this one was tilted. Same thing here, we see a lot of the top, which means our eye line is high. And this one's really narrow, which means our eye line is close. So it's two different eye lines, so it doesn't match. And this sort of relates to perspective. Um, light source. So whenever I, f I see a shadow on an object, um, you can always trace it back to its light source. Find the angle or the top of the shadow, draw a line to the tip of where that shadow is being created, and then just follow that line all the way back, there's your light source. So this is helpful to know if you're ever creating a picture from your imagination and you want it to look like the objects are being lit from the same source, you have to make sure, like if you were to draw another object over here, you would have to make sure the light source angle would cut across the edge of that from a, from a steeper angle over here. Another example. And this is just showing you the closer the light source is, the more the, um, the, the shadow will fan out. And you pull the light source further away, the narrower the shadow fans out. Um, pan perspective, sometimes they call this banana perspective. So this is, this is, we're moving away from more traditional perspective. So this is, this is what happens when you move your head around. So this could easily be a, per a perfectly straight tunnel, but you're turning your head and you're looking to the left at the tunnel and then where the ladder is, and then you turn your head the other direction and you're looking at the down the other end of the tunnel. But when you combine these two different views of your head movement, you get um, this distortion, this kind of curve, which they call banana perspective or pan perspective, because it's the, the camera or the viewer's head panning around. Um, and again, I told you pr traditional perspective does not take into account um, head movement. But certain drawings like this are taking into account head movement. So again, here's another example of banana perspective. Because um, you can imagine this is a square here. So you can imagine if you were doing a, um, like an animation and there's a guy at the top of the building and he needs to jump down and you're going to take this square and you're going to pan down. Um, the, the perspective is going to have to shift. So if you're looking up, you're going to have almost a traditional looking um, three-point perspective. Um, this is all three-point perspective, but it, the bulge happens when your head moves. And you can experiment with this too. If you, if you look at, like, uh, if you're inside a building or your room, take a ruler out and measure the corner 
angle of like the ceiling and look to your left and take that measurement and then look to your right and take the measurement and then you'll see that one tilts down and then the other tilts down in the other direction if you were to combine those two angles it would look like a curved bow so whenever your head is moving and you try to combine those perspectives you're going to get a, a, a bow um, I don't want to get too confusing but just conceptually it's good to keep in mind that the horizon line encircles you so it is possible you can imagine this being the picture plane it is possible to imagine that um, vanishing points would go behind you or outside of the picture plane on the other side of the viewer it is I've seen drawings that do this but that's um, a level perspective we're not going to get to. So here's a two-point perspective gridded box um, done in really, really strict perspective, um, correct perspective. And you can see as it sort of approaches you, because it's getting really close to you, things start to get a little distorted. So in order for it to look more naturalistic, it, you kind of have to um, bow the which we're not going to do, by the way. This, I'm just kind of showing you, like, conceptually how um, perspective works. We're not going to do any drawings like this, but, like, in order for it to, to work correctly, you would have to sort of bow out the, the, um, the lines that go back to the vanishing points. So you can kind of see, if you look at the box now, it feels a little more naturalistic, because if you were looking at a, an object that was this close to you, it would naturally sort of distort because you're looking around at it. This is what I sort of mean. This is almost like a banana perspective. You can kind of see, remember, banana means pan, and it means, like, curve. So if we're, you're standing here as, as a viewer, and you turn your head and you look over to the left, the you're going to see the tiles looking like they're curving in this direction. But then if you then look back over to the right, you're going to see the tile curving in the opposite direction. And then when, if you combine them, you're going to get this banana bend, pan perspective, because your head is panning around. So traditional perspective does not, again, take into account head movement. Here's an artist, um, Paul Houston. He's, you can, I, I, I pulled these all off of his Instagram account. He does these little sketchbook drawings where he sits down, usually like in a cafe or something, and he just does these meticulous little, usually in pen, meticulous drawings. And you can see, so he's looking around, and you get a fisheye kind of distortion when you look, when your head moves around. So you can see, this is what I was talking about when you, if you measure in your room, if you look in this direction, you'll, the, if, when you hold up a ruler or a pencil, you'll get an angle here. And if you look over in this direction, you'll get an angle going here. So there's going to be bending going on if you're measuring while your head is moving around. And he does it to an extreme degree. So you can see he looks down at his table. If you look at, he looks down to his left and the, the table curves this direction. Then if he looks down to his right, the table curves in this direction. So this is probably, believe it or not, this is more accurate to how you actually see the world. Because you're moving around, your head is moving. And you're not really um, locking your head in one one place and closing one eyeball, which is how traditional perspective perceives the world, which is very similar to how a camera sees it in one from one vantage point. Um, here's another one of his drawings. Again, you can see that whenever I see drawings and and you see the the just kind of bending. That means his head is panning around. He's he's uh, pulling in information from um, multiple sort of angles. Um, so here's an example of a perspective where nothing van um, there's no there's not, no vanishing points with um, this type of perspective. It's called isomorphic perspective. And in order to do isomorphic perspective correctly, you kind of need this grid. Um, so you can kind of see these angles will never converge. 
So you need this kind of grid. But um, th the reason why you would draw like this usually, well, I mean, there's many reasons why you would not you wouldn't want things to converge because you don't want distortion to happen. You don't want things further away to look smaller. Um, a lot of people like um, who who are in like um, industrial design will do their blueprints in isomorphic perspective because let's say they're designing an, uh, a tool or an object and there's a bolt that goes on this corner of the object and then over here on this corner of the object there's another bolt they want to let you know that these bolts are the exact same size so they don't want things looking f that are further away to look smaller they want everything to sort of look the same <clears throat> and you've probably seen this type of perspective in video games this is probably how I first encountered this type of perspective, um, where it's just a, the you scroll around, um, and nothing sort of just gets smaller as you move further away. And also, I mean, this is a version of a Chinese scroll, so you can see the people down here are pretty much the same size as the people over here, as the people over here. Um, and you can see the lines are all parallel. They're not going to converge. So it's kind of, they, they, people will call this like the eye of God perspective, meaning like you can roam around anywhere you want. And in a Chinese scroll, you would, you would literally roll it out and you can look further along. You can go further along in this direction or further along in this direction, depending on how you rolled out the scroll. Here's another art, a version of an, um, a perspective done in a more abstract way. This is a painter named David Schnell. Um, I used to really like his work. I still do. I haven't really seen what he does recently, but like he, he kind of does these paintings. And if you look closely at them, he, you can see the charcoal pencils. He, um, he, he's probably using rulers and he's mapping out all this really kind of technically correct per perspective, but then he kind of fills it in. Oops. He fills it in in a very abstract way. Or in a very loose way, but yet yeah, the the interesting thing is that it still feels like pers um, correct perspective. Like the these marks over here, which kind of look like leaves, look big because they're closer to the viewer. But these marks over here get tinier because they're further away from the viewer. So it's kind of an interesting, playful thing to do. To um, here's another version of his paintings. He does the same thing. It's like the marks get smaller as they get further away. There's something kind of naturalistic about you know correct perspective kind of intuitively feels right, even though it's a little restricted. Um, another artist, Tony Robbins, who kind of sort of uses correct perspective, but he actually kind of distorts and he's kind of obsessed with um, cubist depictions of space, which the cubists were sort of interested in combining multiple perspectives. Um, so this is a... Uh, so what's his name? Antonio Lopez Garcia, a Spanish painter. Um, he does this all from life, so he literally puts this, these canvases up on the roof and stays up there for hours and hours and days and days, obsessively painting what he sees. So you can kind of see if you know he's looking in this direction, this looks straight, but as he looks, he turns his head, looks over in this direction, this turns this way. So he's getting that pan perspective, banana bowing kind of thing happening here. And I have to mention atmospheric perspective, because it's technically part of perspective. Um, the idea being everything you're looking at exists in um, air. We, we have an atmosphere that surrounds us. And the further, further, further away you go, the, there's more atmosphere. So it just kind of builds up the further away you go. So you can see the mountain here. It's really dark because it's so close to you gets a little more air in between you and the the mountain ridge here even more even more even more and eventually you know, things disappear this is this usually is more effective in you know landscape but I even say it's a good idea to, to kind of play around with something similar to this even if you're doing a still life sometimes you want things further away to be a little softer and out of focus maybe things you want to be more emphasized, more in focus. You can kind of play around with atmospheric perspective, even though it's not a landscape. And traditionally, you would add more blue because um, the sky is, appears blue to us, but sometimes it can appear orange like this. 
another example of atmospheric perspective in a painting, so you can kind of see just the mountains. I imagine if when he was painting the mountains, he mixed up this kind of yellow brown, and then which each successive recession he added a little bit of more of the sky blue, and it created this perfect kind of um, dissolve into the sky. I, I mean, that's I think that's a good way of thinking of it. Just the objects are slowly dissolving away into more and more sky. And I think one more image. This is um, like an ancient Chinese um, ink wash, which they use a type of atmospheric perspective too. We can see um, the lighter um, mountain ridge appears to be further away in the fog. 